seems to be some sort of some sort of underlying um, voices mm. that make it a all the hard. way through. Yeah, that made it a little bit hard for me to understand. Okay, mm. I'll have to check. I haven't really reviewed those. I just kind of assume they work, but I'll. So they were Sunday school yeah. classes. Yeah, so the one from last week I didn't get to see yet. But okay, the so the one before previous that. Previous okay. ones were like that. Okay. I mean, oh. maybe it's my computer. Oh no. Yeah, Bill has. Oh, that's interesting. Side effects. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Patty and Mike and Phil and Sis and Leslie. Good to have you guys and everyone who's round about here. Nice to have the lashes back with us. Feeling better. That is good. To see you. So thank you um, for being here, everyone. We are on to. Um, I feel like I lost count. I think I miscounted at one point. I think we're at number five. I think we have two to go. Two more letters after today. So the fifth letter to the churches of Revelation in Revelation. So um, we are going to look at that in a moment. But in the meantime, let's first have a little prayer. And then we will look at the church in Sardis. Gracious God, we are grateful for bringing us here this morning gathering us together around your word, asking, Lord, that as we study and learn more about this, this letter, we might see in what way it speaks to us as St. John's, to us personally, and we let you speak to us. We open our hearts to let you speak to us today. So come and be upon us, among us, and let us know you are here. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. I'm a little warm. I'm taking this off. I was at a conference for two days, and I got some things out of conference, but one thing I definitely got is I got a cold because I was sitting under the air conditioning for like three hours, and it was freezing. My wife is quick to say, you don't get cold from the air conditioning. You get cold from the germs. Well, I'm case. I'm a proof right now. We got it from that air conditioning. There's no doubt about it. I wasn't touching people. It was the air conditioning blowing down on me. I finally had to walk a mile back to my car and get a sweatshirt and sit in there. I think the damage was done, so it's hitting me. But anyway, let us look at Revelation 3, 1 to 6. This is the letter to the church in Sardis. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains is, is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet, you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your names out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The church of Sardis, a little shorter of a letter than the last couple that we've looked at. But there seems to be, in my mind, a pretty powerful punch in it. So what are your observations, questions, thoughts? We always start with those. So anything that uh, comes to your mind. Interesting, I'll, I'll just say this. You might notice now, I think the last three, well, maybe all of the four of them, either had some reference to somebody we have no idea who they're talking about. Nicolaitans, Satan, synagogue of Satan, Jezebel, Balaam. I mean, we know Jezebel and Balaam from the Old Testament, but we don't know who they were referencing in the actual church Jesus was writing to. So we have these unknown factors in the first four letters. This letter doesn't have any of those things. It's pretty cut and dry. And I'll maybe speak to why that might be in a few minutes, but 
There was no Nicolaitan in this. There's no Jezebel. There's no Baal. There's no Satan. There's none of that stuff. So just kind of more straightforward, perhaps. What are your thoughts or questions? This is accusing, this is almost accusing the angel of the church himself, whoever that is. Mm. The bishop, maybe. Mm -hmm. Might be accusing the bishop. I know your works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very possible. Other observations? I have each church labeled, and this one is labeled dead. Certainly says that. You're at the... You are dead, and there are some that remains that are at the point of death. So death is a key word to this church, definitely. Anyone else? Questions or observations or thoughts? It sounds like we just got complacent and we're happy and what we were doing no longer. What that is a possible word there, complacent. <laughs> Is that what's going on here? They become complacent. That may be what is happening. I think that people were just going through the motions of religion. Mm. A lot of them were probably unsaved. Mm -hmm. Just going through the motions, doing doing the religious thing, but no heart in it. Yeah. Again. And sometimes you have to wonder, and I'm not picking on you. <laughs> <laughs> If it's the pastor, because a lot of the pastors don't want to preach mm -hmm. anything that's offensive mm -hmm. because of fear of losing the congregation. Right, right. That is but certainly... Fear it. How do you know it? Right. Well, that's certainly a concern. You the Bible up and read it yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And most people won't. So they're going to rely on the pastor. And if, you know, it's, it's something I have to always be mindful of and diligent about. Am I, am I just watering something down? Am I... Unwilling to uh, speak to something that, that's a that's worthwhile here. question. <laughs> What's that? Well, I'm glad you feel that way. So <laughs> that's good. Other thoughts, other observations. Okay, Paul's writing this letter, right? No. No. Yeah. These are from well, technically from Jesus, according to chapter one, but through John. So, I don't know if that'll change your point that you're about to make, but go ahead and make it, Jane. Oh, what is the significance of the seven spirits and the seven stars? How about if we go take care of that right now? So that's the title that Jesus gives in this letter. So each of the letters, he takes something different out of chapter one that was somehow a definition or a label that he that was applied to Jesus and takes that and puts it on himself in these letters. So this one, as we see, he uses the words, the seven, or the definition of de description, um, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And we kind of covered that when we looked at chapter one, because it appeared there. And, and there's fairly strong consensus that, well, and later Jesus actually says, the seven stars are the seven, the seven churches. So he's saying, I'm holding the seven churches. And most people think the seven spirits is just another way of saying the Holy Spirit. Because seven was a perfect number, dot, dot, dot. But the, the general point here that I think is being made by Jesus is he's stating that I'm in control. I hold. I hold these churches. And I hold the spirit. I'm the one you better be listening to, basically. Um... And, and I have this stuff. So he's kind of saying up front, I'm, I'm the answer to any problems I'm going to say are happening here. I'm the one who's going to control things. So just know that. That's what's kind of believed to be the emphasis of that particular description of him that he uses for himself. Let's back up just briefly and talk about Sardis, just to get ourselves a little bit of a, an idea of this particular city. We looked at each one of these so far, Ephesus, um, Thyatira, um, Pergamum. What was last week's? Last week's Thyatira. I'm missing one. Another S, Smyrna. Smyrna, Maryland. So the angel of the church in Sardis, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. 
So here's Sardis. Sardis was, um, again, we, we've heard similar things from a lot of these churches so far. Either they were very uh, important, populated commercial city, or they were an important military city, or they were an important government city. Sardis was another one of these kind of great trade centers. So commerce was important in Sardis. They were also very prosperous. At one time, they, Sardis was considered to be the wealthiest city town in Asia Minor. Not only among these seven cities that the churches are in that the letters are written to, but of all of Asia Minor, Sardis had been at one point the wealthiest. In fact, the first coinage ever minted in Asia Minor was minted in Sardis. Apparently there's some kind of historical proof about that. And that coin, minted coin, really is the beginning of modern money. So in some ways, money, our understanding of money, coins and bills and exchanging those things, uh, as opposed to bartering services or whatever, actual coin exchange, that really kind of began in Sardis. So it was a wealthy place, and it was a famous place. And as I said, it was a center of trade because it was the five-pointville of Asia Minor. <laughs> So you know where Five Point Vo is. So was it on land or was it near the water? It was more inland. We have the map here. So Sardis is kind of an inland, but it it's it's where I was just up in Happy Valley for this conference. So you know you got these valleys and roads are in them and different valleys come together. Well, that's sort of what happens here in Sardis. Um, there's some valleys that are kind of coming together. Uh, and, and there's five different roads. So again, like Five Pointville, there's five different roads that come into Sardis. So there is, it is a spot of a lot of trade. It was also built on a very steep hill. So it was built in such a way and positioned in such a way that it was believed to be impenetrable. Like it, it was a, it, it was a safe place. Okay? Very important to remember that. To the point that no one could militarily get in there. Unless, unless the people of Sardis chose not to be watchful and not to post guards because they had gotten so complacent and thought that things were so secure so that twice in their history, at night, troops were able to descend up the hills or the crags and rocks and get in and defeat the city because there was no one standing guard. That's important because of how Jesus speaks to this church. We'll see in a second. So it was a very strategic place, built on a hill, very steep, but had been besieged twice in history, and both times primarily because they had become very complacent and secure and safe in their thinking and thought nobody could get to them. And they did. They had a reputation as a city and apparently as a church for being very vital. All this trade, everything that was going on, it was a very vibrant and vital and alive city. Um, now, they were also known for having about seven miles from the city, there were these burial mounds. Okay, So that's how they buried people back then. They kind of created mounds. So, so Sardis famously had, not far from it, these burial, burial mounds, necropolis mounds, okay? In 17 AD, so this would be during Jesus' lifetime, there was an earthquake and it destroyed the city. Sardis was no more in 17 AD, but 
it was such an important city that the Roman emperor contributed $600,000, which was a lot of money at that time, as you might imagine, to have it rebuilt. So clearly it was rebuilt, because by the time of these letters being written, which we believe Revelations is probably like late hundreds, so like 95 AD to 100 AD, somewhere in there. So this city had been rebuilt since 17 AD when it was torn down by an earthquake. It was not a center of Caesar worship. It was not a center of idol and other god worship. That that didn't have a that didn't have a, a part in this town. Not that it wasn't happening. It just it wasn't a center like some of the other towns that we've looked at, and some of the uh, rebukes that Jesus puts on those churches relates to the fact that they're dabbling with that stuff. There's none of that rebuke here at all. Um, these people have a reputation for vitality as a city, but it was also a very decadent city. And it had grown kind of slack, complacent, flabby. Some people use that word in some of the things I wrote. I, I mean, I read. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the way this town, this city, was positioned. It was positioned in a way to be um, sheltered and insulated. They were their own little place. People came to them, but the way it was positioned is the city itself, once you got in it, was very sheltered, very insulated. So we know when things get sh people get sheltered and insulated. Um, we know what it's like during COVID. You can also start to become complacent or stir crazy, one or the other. But if you're there long enough, you begin to be lulled into a sense of complacency, a sense of security, um, and and a and just kind of a, an acceptance of where you're at. There's a little less dreaming. There's less innovation. There's less creativity because we got what we need, and here we are. That is the city of Sardis. And apparently, the church of Sardis is a duplicate of the city, a fair, uh, a fair reflection of the city. Because he says, I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. So they have a good name, a good reputation, a good brand, but before God, not so much. They're dead. They're alive, but flabby. Alive, but slack. Alive, but sheltered and insulated. So it's interesting to note You'll re hear me repeat a little bit of this in my sermon today as well, but it's interesting to note, as I said earlier, this is the first letter, maybe the only, I kind of forget the next two, but this is the first letter that does not have Balaam, Nicolaitans, Synagogue of Satan, Jezebel. In other words, it does not have anything referred to in the letter about a threat from the outside, Caesar or anybody like that, or Greek gods, or a threat inside where you're allowing the Nicolaitans, you're allowing Jezebel, one of you, you're allowing in there to, to uh, influence and, and uh, affect you. There is no reference, as I said earlier, to any of those. And what's important about that is it's an indication that these people didn't have any threats. They didn't have any challenges. There was nothing pushing them. They didn't have any push. They didn't have any drive. So they had no reason to work hard at their faith, at their, at their understanding of their, of, of their relationship to God, at any of that. They didn't have to do anything because everything was honky-dory. So there was no slanderous Jewish threats, um, no heretical threats from inside. There was no persecution that's cited here at all. Um, so it begs the question, 
Why not? Why did it seem like the Romans, why did it seem like even the Jews left them alone? Didn't persecute them, didn't create a problem for them, at least not enough that it was something that Jesus cites and says, this is what I have against you. None of that. And again, it would seem that the answer may well have been that they just lacked any, any aggressive and positive Christianity, any aggressive positive faith. Somebody said they were content with mediocrity, lacking both the enthusiasm to entertain a heresy and the depth of conviction which provokes intolerance. It was too innocuous to be worth persecuting. That's what kind of seems to have happened. So this church was kind of at a sense of peace, but it was the peace of death, which is different than the peace of Christ. In any church, there's nothing to be so much desired as peace, but any, any, in any church, there's nothing to be so much feared as peace. We all want peace, but we also ought to fear peace sometimes, because when things are just too quiet, you have to ask yourself, are we really addressing things that need to be addressed? Because when addressed, there's almost always a toe that's going to be stepped on. Or there's almost always somebody out there who says, you guys are doing that? So if you're hearing neither, then there might be a Sardis problem. Um, somebody said this church was like a corpse. I think they mean like a, a viewed corpse. They're usually kind of, they all look very, everybody says, oh, they look so nice, but they're dead. You know? So no matter how nice they look, they are still a corpse. They are still dead. And that's kind of what's happening here. Um, so, what... I have a question. I'll come back to the question. I'll just kind of finish up going through the commentary here. So he says, wake up. Wake up. Probably a better word there, and maybe some other translations. It says, everybody, verse 2... Does everybody's verse 2 start with wake up? Is there something different anybody has? Watchful. Okay. Anybody have anything else? It is probably better interpreted as watch, be watchful, as opposed to wake up, although it's the same concept. But why would be watchful seem to make sense with this church? Why do you think Jesus would say to this church, Watch out. Be watchful. <laughs> well, why would he use that particular word? Go ahead, Esther. We'd be more alert. Waking up, you're okay, you're awake. But if you're watching, you're more alert. And why is that important to this particular church? Because they're so complacent. And what is their history? Not the church, but the city. Twice, the city was overthrown because nobody was watching. So in each of these letters, I'm, I'm trying to help us see, and I'm learning it as well, that the words that are used almost always in some way reference the history of the city. Like the people in Sardis are going to get this. When he says watch, that's going to hit them. Yeah, we know, we know, we don't watch very well. We messed up twice. He's reminding them, that's your history. It's happening in your church. If you don't watch out, the same thing's going to happen. Okay, so wake up, watch. That's probably where this uh, saying history repeats itself comes in. It is exactly, it is. It, it, it is a history repeats itself kind of place. Mm -hmm. And then he says, strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. So, strengthen what remains. Strengthen what is surviving. In other words, strengthen what evidences of life you have. Although he also says, it too is at the point of death. So, not everything is dead yet in Sardis, in the church. There is still some signs of life, which he gets to in a moment. But there is still some signs of life. And he says, you want to strengthen that. Um, and, and he kind of points out that you're going to strengthen that 
sort of in three with three things. You're going to remember, you're going to re obey, and you're going to repent. That's how you're going to strengthen what remains. Remember, repent, excuse me, remember, obey, I think is the order, and repent. He says, I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Now, I always balk and want you to balk when you see English translations use the word perfect. Because it almost never means what we think of perfect. We think of perfect as something that does not have any errors, any mistakes. People, if they're perfect, they've made no mistakes. they failed in no way. They've done nothing wrong. They are perfect. The word perfect in the Greek, and I, I still don't know over all these years, because I'm, I'm, I don't want to act like I know something better than scholars, but every scholar admits that this is the case. So why English translations continue to use that word? Knowing that we will immediately think those things is beyond me. But the word here in Greek isn't never doing anything wrong or getting everything right perfect. It means complete. It means overall kind of having done something complete. That could mean you did it right. That could be where the idea comes from that there's nothing wrong. But the point being that it's full. It's complete. It's as it's supposed to be. So when he says, I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God, he's not saying I found you doing a bunch of stuff wrong. He's saying what you have been doing is not, it's not complete. It's superficial. That's kind of the opposite here of perfect in this context. It's superficial. It's surfacey. It has no depth to it. It means nothing. Okay? That's what he's saying. I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Implication, your works have been superficial. <clears throat> so remember, <clears throat> he says, and the, the tense of that word means to keep on remembering. It's not just a one-time thing. Keep on remembering. Don't ever let yourself forget. Bear in mind. Keep recalling is kind of the idea here. What you received. And that is in a tense that means you've received something of which you actually still have possession. So you still have what is valid, valuable or meaningful to Christian life and living and being alive, of having Christ's life. You still have it. You have received it. You just got to keep remembering that. You got to keep remembering that you're alive in Christ and for Christ and because of Christ. Don't forget it. What's happening is you're taking it for granted. Probably. Again, let's keep in mind the real possibility that what's behind the wording of this letter is a reminder to a city that is very well aware that it had it is in a very great place, but that placement and the approach to it of complacency led to overthrow twice. So when Jesus is saying here to them, um, keep keep remembering what you have in Christ. Don't take it for granted like you took for granted your safety, like you took for granted your security, like you always take things for granted because you're a city who feels like everything's always fine. So keep remembering what you received and heard. And obey it. The word obey here means keep it, as in act upon it. Action. Again, that's the deal. Your actions, he says, you're alive, but you're dead. Um, I know your works. You have been working, but they're superficial. That's because you haven't been remembering what you have and living that 
obey that, keep going with that, and repent. Um, repent, we talked about that a number of times. It's not just a word that means to do something differently, it also means to begin to think, to think something differently, and that'll lead to different actions, okay? So it all goes together. So start thinking differently about yourselves. You are not, in other words, you're not this, don't, don't just think on your security and don't just think on just how uh, inoculated you are from everything, but think on what I'm telling you to think on here. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Again, we know that phrase from words Jesus says back in the Gospels. You know, I will come again like a thief in the night. You won't know when I'm coming. However, this is not Jesus referring to his second coming, as he might have been referring to in the Gospels. What he's basically saying is, I'm always coming. I'm always here. Pay attention. Look out, because I, I, I come. You better stay awake, because... I'm right here for you, and you're missing me. He uses this phrase, again, why do you think he uses this phrase with these people? History. Because that's exactly how they were overthrown twice. <laughs> people came at night like a thief in the night and threw them out, overthrew them because they were sleeping. So he says, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like that thief in the night, and you're not going to know when I'm going to come. And basically, if you think those people overthrew you, wait to what happens when I come. Things are going to change. So um, you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes, um, which is interesting because in the other churches, it usually talks about there being a few who have fallen away. Like a few have been following Jezebel. A few among you are listening to Balaam, or a few among you are doing, this, are doing the wrong thing. It is the first church where he says there's a few among you that are actually still okay. So he flips that around with this group. There's a few who have not soiled their clothes. Um, they will walk with me dressed in white. So that white, we kind of talked about that a little bit before when it came to the white stone. That was uh, at one of the churches there. Again, white still has, whether it's a stone or clothing, it still carries with it either the idea of purity, the idea of victory, or the idea of festivity joy, or all three together. But they're going to walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. They are worthy. It's not that these people did something good or right. They're worthy because they, they didn't forfeit what they had. That's the thing that makes them worthy. They didn't give up and forfeit Christ to their complacency. So if you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes. Again, purity, festivity, victory. And I will not blot your name out of the book of life. Now again, this might, the use of the book of life might have some significance to Sardis specifically, but most likely to all these churches, all these cities, because every city did have a registry. Well, remember, how does the story of Jesus start? They ought to all go register in their own homes, or hometowns. So uh, Joseph had to go to Bethlehem because that's where he was from. So every city did have a registry of citizens. And the only way I think you got crossed off the registry of citizenship is if you, if you were a traitor or you died. So um, he said, I will not blot your name out of the book of life. Why would he blot their name out? Either they're traitors or they're dying. They die. And what has he been saying about this church? 
guys think you're alive, but you're dying or you're dead. So um, people were, were used to know, used to that language, that idea of being no longer a citizen of a place they want to be a, a citizen of because of treason or death. I will confess your name before my father and before his angels, which is reminiscent of Jesus' words when he says, everyone in Luke, he says, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God, but whoever disowns me before men will be disowned before the angels of God. So here he says, I'm going to acknowledge you if you, if you wake up and remember and start, you know, living, start obeying, repenting, and living like I've given you life to live in Christ. So let anyone who has an ear to hear, listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Again, that is a line that is at the near conclusion or the very conclusion of every one of these letters. So, there's a bit of an idea of the Sardis church. Again, a little, in some ways, a little easier to talk about just because you're not, we're not bogged down with those names and those groups that no scholarship, unfortunately, has ever figured out 100% because there's very little reference to them elsewhere in history or even in scripture. Or if there is, there's still not an understanding of who he's specifically talking to in these churches. So we don't have any of that to sort through. Something that's fairly straightforward in some ways. Now, what thoughts or questions are stirred by my stuff? I'm trying to figure out your definition of traitor. You mean a businessman or a guy who's... Oh, traitor. Traitor like uh, Benedict Arnold. Okay. I should enunciate or at least write it down. Because <laughs> you're right. They sound the same. Traitor. And I talked about them being a, a trade city. So you're right. Um, and that was an issue for one of the other churches where they, they were caught up in the trade guilds. And that was part of their of the thing God, that Jesus had against them. Um, so... And people that belong to these churches, they weren't all Gentiles, were they? No. No, they wouldn't have been uh, because most of these cities, again, had kind of a pretty good mixture of people in them, particularly any, any place that's five points. You've got people coming from all over. So there would have been a pretty fair mixture there. Um, Even Jewish people that would have accepted Christ? Right, because they, they seem to exist in some of the other churches that are cited there so any other thoughts any other questions and the Romans were in charge at this time the right? Romans would have still been in charge at this time yeah this was part of their empire yes that's the word you're looking for the Roman Empire yeah so um, let's ask kind of this uh, for a few minutes here Sort of more of a uh, practical question. We, we hit a, a little bit earlier, uh, but let's try to think more in depth. So when, today, when do we think a church is in danger of the peace of death? P-E-A-C-E. -E. When do we think a church can be in danger of what we're calling here the peace of death, meaning a peacefulness, but it's a peacefulness that kind of leads to death. When you lose population, uh, church population. Okay. Tell me a little bit more about that. What well, do you mean by that? Uh, not getting in new people, not raising up new children Okay. Uh, within the church. This is not being new. No, that's not the, I know what you mean. <laughs> not being new. While you're in that position as a church where you're not you're not gaining, you're not getting any new, how how can that church still feel a peace? That 
that's certainly not a good piece, but what's the piece they feel while this is happening? Well, I think a lot of people would say this is God's will. Oh, okay. Hmm. That's probably a, that's a good point. That's probably a good slogan for a lot of churches and people who are kind of subtly in the grips of the peace of death and don't even realize it. It just it's easy to see what's well, God's will and step away from everything. Yeah. Okay? I don't have to do it because somebody else will do it. You mean answer this question or that's your answer? <laughs> <laughs> right. Someone else will do it. That too can be a slogan of that piece of death where, oh, we think it'll get done. Someone will do it, but it's the same somebody. And everybody else is just feeling like, oh, it's great. It's getting done, you know, until one day somebody can't do it. Especially I think that as I'm getting older, mm -hmm. the young ones do it. Although Grandma Moses started painting when? When she was 90 or something? She and Hattie Brunner, they both started. <laughs> <laughs> also, when you have attrition through death in your uh, uh, religious community, uh, those someone else's are no longer there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And if going back to what you're saying, Gene, is your if your idea is someone else will do it, let the younger people do it. But you're here. You're not gaining any new people. You don't have any younger people. You don't have any new people because you haven't gained them. So there is no backup someone what often can happen there. All right? How else do we experience the peace of death in a church? You give in to the culture and don't preach the Bible anymore. Okay. Give in to culture. Stop preaching scripture. I think, interestingly, not the opposite so much, but kind of a corollary to that is that we can do this well while never never participating with this which certainly would not be something Jesus would do either Jesus participated with culture but there are some who say don't don't get out there in the culture you know we preach the word and we don't we don't mix with anybody and that that's another piece i'm content because we preach the word, we preach scripture, but we haven't we haven't engaged anybody with Christ. We haven't gone out into the culture very much, um, and and that too can be a piece of death at times. Other ideas. Where else have we experienced a piece of death or know of that? No outreach programs. What's that? No outreach program. Okay. No outreach. Okay. We're not going outside of ourselves. Insulated. It's just us. We're staying here. We're not, not we're worrying about anybody else. We're going to take care of us and our own. That's that has its merits at times, but it certainly reflects a Sardis church eventually. And we are doing that. We are going outside. I'd like to think so. With all those <laughs> missions and things. Yeah. Now, again, back to LeVon's point, you have to be careful when you go outside that you don't compromise. There's another word that, that you don't compromise. At the same time, preaching scripture should always take you not only to your own, but outside as well. And some churches have a piece of death because they're just 
they're in themselves only. Anything else? You know my 80-year-old started reading the Bible? Go ahead, tell me. It's our last instruction manual. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's a lot. Is that 80 years old? Well, I, I intend to live 120, so I've still got 40 years of it. <laughs> um, I think some other ways that churches can kind of have this piece of death is where we just kind of get, again, if you keep thinking of, of that complacent or contented word, where we just, as they say, uh, we never did it that way before. <laughs> oh, <yes. Okay. laughs> so, again, you get kind of satisfied with your way, and your way may be fine as a church, but always have to remember it's, you know, it's not our way, it's God's way. God's way a lot of times can look a whole lot different than our way. That's that's for sure. So I know oh. that movie that actor says, it's either my way or the highway. <laughs> right. That's a common phrase. And unfortunately, a lot of churches, they would never say that. No one's ever going to say that. But I was just, one of the workshops I went to was about Kindness, being kind, how how have churches lost their kindness. And one of the examples, and I've heard this over the years, and I've, I've seen it over, over the years in certain places, when churches have like a program that they've been doing forever. So you, what happens in a lot of churches is you have these programs, you're doing forever, whether it's candy making you've done forever, or you, you made cheesesteaks or whatever, you've done it, and you, and you have this group of people who've done it. Eventually what happens is they can't do it as much. So what do they say? We can put all these together with well, the young people ought to get involved. So guess what happens? A young person or two comes, or somebody who's never done it before comes. And what do they encounter? Well, we never do it like that. You've got to do it this way. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. They find no, no kindness. And, and so they don't come back again. You know, because they came to help. Everybody's saying we need help with this. But when they got there, it's my way or the highway. There's a little grace. It's just, this is the way we do it. Don't do it any different. And so, in the process, you settle into the peace of doing it the way you do it. But eventually, um, eventually, you lose the people in the process. They're coming home for church. What time? It's like 10 up. That's good. I just got to make sure, though, that I can see everybody to mute them. Here we go. Okay. Muted. All right. Um, any other answers? Any other thoughts? Any any from the uh, Zoomers? I just think any time uh, one one thing for any church and church leadership, church pastor. We always have to be mindful of when we step back and we sort of think, okay, we're getting it right. We have, we're doing it right. This is good. Let's let's keep doing it this way. That that can be a God thing, but always remember, it seems in Scripture that when God works through the Holy Spirit, it often God often works in ways that are mysterious, as we say, or different. They're not going to always be how we see it. So it's okay to say this is what we do, this is how we do it, and, it's, and we want to keep doing that, and God maybe has blessed that, and that's wonderful. But make sure you're always being discerning, particularly in leadership. Are we at a peace that could become a complacency, an inoculation that's keeping God, that, that's setting us away toward death? Or are we at a peace that's still open to the fact that there are, all sorts of ways that God's keeping us alive and, and bringing life out of us and not to miss those ways. Um, so a worthwhile thing to always keep in front of us, I think probably of all the churches in these letters, this one can be one that uh, really speaks to us still today in a lot of ways. Definitely. So, All right. That takes us to next week. I don't have my Bible in front of me. Who's next week? 
It's Philadelphia. Oh, that's right. I knew that. Philadelphia and then loud is. So uh, just a little heads up. Philadelphia will be just like Smyrna in that Philadelphia does not get any. Uh, it's all it's all compliments. Check it out now. But, yeah, <laughs> not quite the Philadelphia we're aware of. <laughs> No, Laodicea, last, Laodicea, I think, is the last one. Which one's the last one? Laodicea. That's the lukewarm one. So we'll kind of talk about this kind of thing again. That's the one where I think so. Let me, yeah. Yeah, Laodicea is the last one. Philadelphia is the last one. And then it becomes crazy, right? Weird. Well, stuff. you know what? That I'm kind of reminded as we go through this. Revelation does become very symbolic, all sorts of things, and things that we don't understand, anywhere we understand, Balaam, Jezebel, all that stuff. But a lot of these titles that we see at the beginning of each of these letters, they come back again. A lot of the things in these letters come back again, like the, the Book of Life. The name of the Book of Life, that's later in Revelations. It appears again. Uh, so again, the, the stars, all, a lot of these things are repeated so that it's interesting to think about what happens from chapter 4 on. In some ways, it's still written to these, these seven churches. It's still addressing the stuff that's going on there. It just gets more symbols. So there's additions to the Balaams and Jezebels and synagogues of Satan. There's new ways of talking about probably Caesar and idol worship and all that. They bring in beasts and horns and ten-headed things. Most likely those are all still very similar to the things that they're talking about that he's talking about in these first seven letters. So the seven letters are just kind of setting it all up. But it's just in some ways it's just expounding on these churches and their problems and how it's gonna play out. So what do you think that Jesus is no, I will come like a thief. So with, with Sardis? Yeah. Well, I think it, it would seem you'd probably do like he says in the, the first letter to Ephesus when he says, I'll, I'll snuff out your candle. Okay. You know, meaning well, you're just not going to be here anymore. He said, we're just going to take your name off of that. He's going to take your name out of that, out of that, that book. book. Right. Now, again, we have to be careful. I mean, it, 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 that always opens up the question of, well, I thought once I accept Jesus, I'm saved. This isn't necessarily, these letters aren't necessarily in the vein we think of in that 2,000 years later. We are all caught up in this personal salvation thing. Am I going to heaven? It's all about me. These letters are written to churches who are supposed to be the light of Christ. And God set that up. He sent the Spirit to the churches to be the light of Christ. And he's talking about that light, not necessarily the personal individual's place in heaven. He's talking about the church, this body's place in their community. God's not leaving. Christ isn't leaving. But your church might be done. We'll have to do it a different way. But you guys, you're, you know, you're creating more problems than, than helping. So we're shutting the church down is what he's kind of saying. So kind of keep that in mind, too, as you, as you read these things. Look at them less as a personal thing. Not that they don't apply to us personally. These issues certainly apply. Complacency applies to me personally in my faith. But um, I think, I, I don't think, I, I don't believe Scripture backs up the idea that when I'm pers personally faithless, God's going to wipe my name out that he's given me in the name of Christ. I, I don't think that. Um, but at the same time, that I don't think is what's being spoken up here. It's more about the existence and the work of a church and of its angel, of its of its bishop or its minister. So some of this writing your name out of the book or shut, turning off your light, so to speak, maybe it's time for this minister. You're uh, uh, taking the spirit from you, moving on to somebody else, like he did with King uh, Saul. Forgive the King David. So. It's a little bit more about church than we think it is, because we're just so prone to reading all this just by ourselves about ourselves. So, 
Okay, off to worship we go. <laughs> no guard in the free train there. Yeah. <laughs> and all of you on Zoom, just stay there. I think it's all, I, I don't think you'll go anywhere. I might leave, but I'll be back. Was your point any better? Well, doctor suggested marijuana. Yeah, <clears throat> you were going to do that. Didn't you? We have to get a card, and you oh. have to do it via your computer. My my tablet just died, so I don't know what to do. Get another one. I would like another one, but my gosh, and all this extra stuff. I don't know what to do. Looking up things. So we're at a standstill right now. Had it down at Best Buy and they said, oh, it's your cord. They got it up to like 8%. Theirs, well, I got another cord and plugged it in. Sure, we're turned off in case the bitch box.
she didn't need her food last night either.